Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part 33, the ancient and later supplements, book five, the written word of Kabbalism, second period from the doctrine and literature of the Kabbalah by Arthur Edward Waite. 11, the ancient and later supplements. The sudden appearance in public of a work which either has or purports to have remained in concealment for several centuries may be expected to lead to the discovery or manufacture of continuations or connections thereof. And thus we have two series of Zoharic writings subsequent to the Book of Splendor and distinguished as its ancient and later supplements. As productions of this kind multiply, their authenticity does not tend to assume a stronger guise and the documents with which we shall deal in this section, the reader will do well to regard as without determined claims. I should add, however, that considerable importance and authority have been always ascribed by Kabbalists to the ancient supplements, and according to Frank, they have been known as long as the Zohar itself. They contain explanations of the term seen here by R. Simeon ben Yochai after 70 different ways, and hence the work is divided into 70 chapters with 11 further chapters added at the end. It was printed by Jacob ben Naphtali at Mantua in 1557 under the editorship of Emanuele di Benevento and appeared again at Cracovia. Among notable matters in these ancient supplements, we find the attribution of the members of the human body to the Sephiroth, whence the practical magic of the West may have obtained later on its notion of divine and angelic names ruling those members. The apex of the head and brain is referred to Ketha, the brain as a whole to Chokma, the heart to Bina, the back and breast are attributed to Tifereth, the arms to Chest and Gebera, the legs to Netzach and Hod, the generative organs to Jesod, the feet to Malkuth. Later, Kabbalism recognizes other correspondences, the arbitrary nature of which is obscured sometimes by an appearance of methodical precision. There are better things than this in the supplements to the Zoharic books, and it may be well supposed that some, out of all the 70 ways of interpreting the much debated word which is rendered beginning in Genesis, should be suggestive as well as curious. A single instance must, however, suffice. In the beginning, God created. This is the soul when it emerges from the bosom of its mother and is taught thereof. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, Genesis 1, 2, because the eyes of the soul were closed. Hath it opened its eyes, and God said, let there be light. Hereafter man is gathered in from this world, and this then is written about the soul. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered unto one place, and let the dry land appear. When the soul is removed from a man, his body remains even as dry land. That French school of occultism, which is just beginning to recognize in the plays of Shakespeare, a veiled scheme of initiation has, it must be admitted, an influential mystic precedent in the biblical exegesis of the Zohar, of which the above passage seems to be a very neat instance, arbitrary beyond all words, and yet not without a certain grace of notion. One of the most celebrated quotations from the ancient supplements is, however, the prayer of Elijah though it belongs only to the prefatory part. Lord of the universe, one alone art thou, but not according to number. Thou art the most sublime of all that is sublime, the most withdrawn of all things concealed, and conception cannot attain thee. Thou hast produced ten forms which we call Sephiroth, and thou guidest by means of these the unknown and invisible as well as the visible worlds. In them thou dost veil thyself, and permeated by thy presence their harmony remains undisturbed. Whosoever shall depict them as separated, it shall be accounted unto him as if he dismembered thy unity. These ten sephiroth are developed in successive gradations, so that one is long, another short, and the third intermediate between them. But thou art he who guideth them, and whether from above or below art guided thyself by none. Thou hast provided the sephiroth with garments which serve human souls as intermediate phases. Thou hast muffled them in bodies, so called in comparison with the vestments surrounding them, and the totality corresponds to the members of the human form. Thou art the Lord of the worlds, the foundation of all foundations, the cause of all causes. Thou dost water the tree from that source which spreads life everywhere as the soul spreads it through the body but thou hast thyself neither image nor form in all that is within or without. Thou didst emanate heaven and earth, that which is above and that which is below, with the celestial and terrestrial hosts. All this didst thou do that the worlds might know thee. 
Yet no one can conceive thee in thy reality. We know only that apart from thee, whether above or below, there can be no unity, and that thou art Lord of all. Each Sephira possesses a prescribed name after which the angels are called, but thou hast no determinate name, for all names are informed by thee, and thou only givest them force and reality. If thou shouldst withdraw from the vestments, they would be left like bodies devoid of souls. Thou art wise, yet not with positive wisdom. Thou art intelligent, but not with a definitive intelligence, nor hast thou a fixed place. Yet all these things are attributed to thee, so that man may conceive thine omnipotence, and may be shown how the universe is guided by means of severity and mercy. If therefore a right or left side or any center be named, it is only to exhibit thy government of the entire universe by comparison with human actions, but not because any attribute can be really imputed to thee, corresponding either to law or to grace. The distinction between God and his attributes, and hence between God and the Sephiroth, which in a manner are his attributes emanated, is insisted on elsewhere in the supplements by the help of a striking illustration. Woe unto those whose hearts are so hardened, whose eyes so blinded that they regard God as the totality of his attributes. They are like unto a madman who should describe the king as the totality of his insignia. Behold, a king wears his insignia only that he may be known through them. And verily the king of kings, the concealed of all the hidden, the cause of all causes, is disguised in a splendid garment, so only that he may be known thereby, and thereby may impart to the dwellers on this earth a conception of his sacred nature. This distinction has at first sight an appearance of considerable profundity, but perhaps in the last analysis it is rather childish than otherwise, for it is obvious that even in our finite humanity there is a latent and unseen nature behind all its manifested characteristics. Man is not exhausted by any description of his attributes, and to insist that this is true also of God seems scarcely necessary. From what has been quoted above, it will be seen that the ancient supplements are identical in their teachings with the Zohar itself, and some affirm that the original work had existed from time immemorial at Fez in Africa. We have no means of checking this statement, nor is there any authority for supposing with Isaac Meyer that it was brought thither by disciples of Rab Hay, the Garn of the sages of Chervan on the Caspian Sea. There is, on the other hand, no need to say that hostile critics make use of weak points in the ancient supplements as if there were no distinction between these and the Zohar proper. In the section on the bibliographical content of the Book of Splendor, we have seen what is broadly embraced by the new Zohar, namely a sequel to the hidden commentary, certain additional supplements, a commentary on the Canticle of Canticles, and another on the Book of Lamentations. This enumeration conveys no idea of importance, and perhaps it will be unnecessary to say that occultists are for the most part unaware that these tracts are in existence. I should add that they have not been translated nor am I acquainted with the existence of any printed copy beyond that of Krakow, though it has been termed the Editio Princeps. This appeared in 1703, or subsequently to the Kabbalah Denudata. Its history seems entirely unknown, and it would be preposterous to make any claim concerning it. It may also be noted that later still, Isaac ben Moses of Satanau, though otherwise of some literary repute, wrote a forged Zohar which may have deceived a few persons, but it was speedily unmasked. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.